American humorist Mark Twain once said, if a person flies off the handle, they seldom make for a good landing. You remember last week, we we're in the book of Acts chapter 15, and Paul and Barnabas had a sharp disagreement. Paul did not want Barnabas to include John Mark in this new outreach of uh, ministry and travel because early on he had deserted them. And Barnabas, whose very name meant son of encouragement, took issue with that. So the Bible says at the very end of chapter 15, where we concluded last week, there was a sharp disagreement. I remind you that Tony Evans said God can take a mess and make a miracle out of it. And he will. He will send two teams of four and then more to spread the gospel across the world at that time. Pastor Mark Hensley here with my beautiful wife, Laura, from our basement here in Colorado Springs. I want to welcome you. Actually, we're in Fountain, Colorado Springs. By the way, Laura, did you know today I read, Ben reminded me, according to some new poll, Colorado Springs is the second most, most desirable place to live in the nation. That sounds like that could bring a whole lot more people. <laughs> no more, no more. We are full up, it seems like. But I'm glad that you're watching tonight. I want to remind you to pray for um, Carolyn Southworth, who had shoulder surgery, spoke with her today. She is in a lot of pain. Pray for her recovery. Pray for Janice Campbell. She had a fall last Saturday while spending time with some grandkids and has broken a bone in her back. So we want to pray for those dear ladies. Lord, thank you for the privilege to be here tonight. Thank you for the privilege to bear one another's burdens. We pray for Janice that you would grant her healing from this uh, break in her back and that the pain would subside. We pray the same thing for Carolyn. <coughs> Thank you for Carolyn's life. And I pray that she'd have a full recovery from this shoulder surgery. Bless everyone watching and speak to us from your word tonight is my prayer in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Beginning at Acts 16, Boy. verse 1. Then he came to Derbe and Lystra, meaning um, Paul. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was a Greek." It's a good place to stop because you remember chapter 15 is a Jerusalem council that met specifically to settle this issue that you had to be, according to the Judaizers, those men who had been saved but still held tenaciously to Old Testament law and were requesting that um, people be men be circumcised after salvation or as a part of it. And they clarified that and said, no, it's by grace we are saved not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. So immediately in chapter 16, we can be initially perplexed if Paul was a part of this group of God's leadership that settled this uh, divisive issue about circumcision. Why in the world then would he circumcise Timothy? Well, it wasn't because he wanted to necessarily uh, send a message that it was necessary for salvation. But he's considering his context. He's in a region uh, where predominantly Jewish people, they know Timothy's father was a Greek. So by circumcising him, it kind of allowed him to make inway and to be able to share the gospel. He had learned that it's better to create an atmosphere where I can at least share the gospel without um, hindrance. So that's, that seems almost like a contradiction, but it's really not contextually. It needed to happen just to move the gospel forward uh, and to kind of validate uh, uh, Timothy's um, relationship and servitude with the Apostle Paul. So that takes place. And you notice that uh, as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So they're sharing the truths of the Word of God and of recent uh, decisions among the group of leadership uh, that were in Antioch. So the churches, uh, well, the decisions came down from Antioch, but the uh, 
the ones he's referencing took place in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. You see a um, snapshot of the early church. They were increasing in faith and the churches were growing. There was an increased number daily. Church growth is one of those paradoxes of ministry life. If you evaluate the effectiveness of Jesus' ministry, you will have to say, uh, of course, he's the Son of God, so he did exactly what he was called to do. But if you looked at it in a, in a, a, a direct way from outside of the, the, uh, the faith, some would say, well, you know, at the very end, all these multitudes that he fed and the, the people that warmed to him a week earlier when he rode into Jerusalem on a colt, fulfilling the book of Zechariah's prophecy, Behold, your king comes riding on a colt. Colt, he was abandoned at the cross. You had only one disciple there, John, and then you had four women there. Where was everyone else? Well, it's important for us to not always, not always assess growth by numbers. Sometimes a church like we have gone through, but not just us, every church in the world has gone through the challenges of COVID. And uh, seeing the church, literally, there was months and months and months, Laura, it was just our family there. That was it. That was all. And then within the last six months, it wasn't uncommon for us to have 20 people, 25 people slowly coming back. This past Sunday, I think we had close to 60. The Sunday before, over 70. We're starting to see the church come back. But along the whole time, we didn't stop teaching, we didn't stop preaching, and we didn't stop ministering. And I'm so thankful for this church because the church has a heart for our community. Right after COVID uh, was unleashed on the world, we had wonderful servants who met uh, daily making lunches for children across the street in low-income housing that were now not able to go to school and not having school lunches, the elderly in the mobile home park that is near the church. We prepared 80 lunches a day, but we also, in those lunch bags, put kid-friendly uh, devotions and uh, things they could do, color and so forth. But then the adult bags that went to the mobile home parks, we put in... Uh, Letters from me, some of the staff, um, letters of encouragement, scripture verses, tracts. The point is, in, without question, in modern history, let's just say it that way, this church stood against the winds of adversity and didn't bleak an eye because we kept our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And now I'm seeing the church come back. You sow that seed, you reap later than you sow. And so in this context, the ministry continues. The ministry, sometimes uh, sometimes I think it's like the, Laura, I think ministry is like the old spiritual. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. But we can be faithful in season and out. So was Paul, so was Timothy. And the work, as you can see, is progressing. Here's what David Jeremiah says about how the church was growing in this time. He said, all living things, if they're healthy, should experience growth. And the church is no exception. Although individual churches may experience barriers to growth. Hello, COVID. Those barriers should diligently be overcome. Growth is at the heart of Christ's great commission. And folks, tomorrow, because it happens every Thursday, we're going to have a community meal People will come. I helped a homeless lady today. Laura, I haven't even had time to tell you that. And gave her some food, invited her tomorrow. Then we'll take a group of people down to um, Dorchester Park, South Nevada. And we will feed, like we did last week, probably 60 maybe more people. And give each one of them a track that points to Christ. So sometimes it's not the, the size of your church numerically. But are you making an impact in your community? I shared Sunday um, at the very end of the message uh, about Tom Mercer's book called um, Oikos. It's called The World is Much Smaller Than You Think. And it's an outreach focus realizing that all of us 
have 10 to 15 people around us that God has providentially placed there for us to speak life into their lives. Might be someone who bags your groceries, might be your mailman, might be your neighbor. I don't know who your oikos is. And oikos, by the way, is more than yogurt, right? Greek yogurt, oftentimes, at least one uh, brand is called oikos. It just means the community, the neighborhood, oikos. We have that around us and the world is smaller than you think. And you can touch a life with an effort all the time. The Macedonian call is the next section of uh, chapter 16. Verse 6 says, Now when they had gone through Pergia and the region of Galatia, so they're on the way, everywhere they go, they're sowing seed. And the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Now this is fascinating to me. Paul wanted to go east. And God's Spirit said, No. You're not going that way for whatever reason. So um, after they came to Amicia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Twice, back-to-back -back examples that sometimes God will say no. And I believe He does that to protect us. He sees things we can't see. Uh, there used to be an old country song that says, Thank God for unanswered prayer. Um, God has a perspective that we have, don't have access to. He has foreknowledge. In fact, one of the most wonderful attributes of God, He's omnipotent, He's all-powerful. He's omnipresent, He's everywhere at once. But He's also omniscient. That means He is all-knowing. Sometimes God will keep you from going where you think you should go because He has something else for you to do somewhere else. I don't know how all that works. Um, I liked how one pastor put it once. He said, there's no perfect place to serve the Lord except in the place where he has set you down. So bloom where you're planted. Make a difference where you are. There's hurting people all around us. And sometimes, sometimes we long for a different place. And sometimes we long for greener grass. And it may be that the only reason the grass is greener on the other side of the fence is there's a broken septic tank over there. Just be faithful, be joyful where you are. I had told uh, Laura about um, my favorite preacher, Dr. Rogers, who came from Florida, born and bred. He said, I was born in Florida, wed in Florida. He said, I was born, bred, and I wanted to be Florida dead when I died. God called him to Memphis, Tennessee, which is not like Florida. He said, uh, when I got there, he said, it rained about the first two months. And then he said, and uh, then the fall came and the trees were full of leaves and those were pretty. He said, and then they just fell off the trees. And now you have these bony fingers of tree limbs sticking into the sky. He said, then it snowed. He said, I thought it was grits. And he said, I just had a bad attitude about it. And the Lord um, spoke to his heart and he said, Adrian, you don't like where I've sent you? And they had a conversation, and finally he realized God placed me here by divine appointment, and I'm going to choose to be happy. And he said he chose to be joyful and thankful for where he was. He said he never, ever had, what, had Florida homesickness again. Sometimes it's, it's in the heart, it's in the attitude to be thankful where you are. So after um, so passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Paul, after most likely an exhausting day of ministry, tries to sleep. His thoughts are tumbling around in his brain. He's uneasy. Uh, un, um, he can't fall to sleep. You ever had been like that? You're so exhausted. You want to sleep, but sleep doesn't come. And then he has a vision. God sent vision. Macedonia. That's not east. That's west. What you're going to love about the section that we're going to get to next week is Paul was sending him to Europe. He was sending him to Philippi. He was sending him to found a church, the first church on the European continent. Philippi was named after Philip of Macedonia, the father of Alexander the Great. And it would be, it was a military town, and it would be 
the place where God would spread the gospel all over Europe to our ancestors, most of us watching tonight. God doesn't make mistakes, folks. He knows what he is doing. Now, after he'd seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia. This is the first instance in the book of Acts. We're already well into chapter 16 that Luke, the doctor and the traveling physician of the Apostle Paul, who was a foremost historian, injects himself in the passage. And he says, we. If you look at we, you wonder what we means in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. He means Dr. Luke and Paul and Timothy are heading to Philippi where they will meet a lady, a very special lady, that we'll meet next week. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. You notice Paul was sensitive, as Dr. Jeremiah said, enough to the Spirit of God that he could tell the difference between no and yes when he came to discovering God's will. And Jeremiah says he was obedient enough to respond to both. This time God directed Paul to leave Asia Minor and go to Europe. And he's going to go to Philippi. Maybe you're watching tonight and you're in a place that you don't like. It's not home to you. It's not what you wish it was. Or maybe it's been home, but home life has been disrupted somehow. And you find yourself weary of it all. I think that comes to all of us in times of life. We become weary of well-doing. The Bible says, don't be weary in well-doing, for you will reap a harvest if you don't faint. Faint's an interesting word in the New Testament. It's a metaphor for giving up. That's why the Bible says in Luke 18, 1, men and women should always pray and not faint. Don't give up. Your miracle is closer than you think. And sometimes we quit right before the miracle breaks through. Florence uh, Chadwick was a long-distance swimmer in the 50s. She had swam the English Channel more than once. And she decided to come over to America from her native England across the pond. And she wanted Laura to swim from Catalina Island to the coast of California. That's about 23 miles. Can you, I mean, they have great white sharks in the Pacific, right? And so, uh, but she was trained to do it. And she got in the water on a foggy a lot of California is foggy. We experienced that when we were out there. So she gets in. Her mom and uh, handlers, help people who are helping her, are in a rowboat next to her. And off she goes. And the fog just set in like it can do in uh, Northern California. And she couldn't see the shore. She, she got weary. She, she quit. She, Florence said, take me out. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm done. I'm tired. And she was only, you find this interesting, Laura, about a mile and a half from shore. Here's what Florence Chadwick said. She said, if I could have seen the shore, I would have finished that swim. Sometimes, because of life and, oh my goodness, inflation, the highest it's ever been. I was telling Laura I had to get some gas for our mower today. and It was like $5 for just a little over a gallon and something. Baby formula, hard to come by, which we're concerned because of James. We're, we have a pretty good stock, but it's just in short supply. And the war in the Ukraine, innocent people being brutalized, sadness on every front. And that's why you and I, as believers, have to look up through the tears, through the fog of current circumstance and say, you know, I'm a child of God, and he's going to get me to my appointment with him no doubt about it remember this folks god hasn't promised us an easy journey but he's promised us a safe landing god had a purpose in the division that sent barnabas this way and paul that way god had a purpose when he said no you cannot go east i want you to go west and a part of that purpose ultimately through the last two millennia of preaching of the gospel reached you and your people and my people and that's awesome don't forget 
the God we serve can make a miracle out of a mess. Father, thank you tonight for this time with these friends. Anoint the teaching of your word. And if someone's discouraged, distressed tonight, fill that heart with the hope of God in Christ Jesus is my prayer. Amen. Pastor Mark Hensley here with Laura from our basement in Fountain, hoping you have a great rest of your evening. Hope to see you Sunday. We're going to have a wonderful time in the Word and would love to have you visiting uh, again if you're a guest, but coming back if you're a member. Have a great evening, folks. Good night.